Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Philippe Genereux from uh, New Jersey Morris Technical Center. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today to discuss about TAVI uh, in bicuspid aortic valve using the uh, Sapien 3 platform. I'm uh, very pleased and honored to be joined by the fantastic panel, um, George Camford, a cardiac surgeon uh, from Germany, um, Dr. Uh, Radosla Parma uh, from Poland, and uh, my good colleague and friend Didier Cheche from uh, Toulouse, France. Um, today, what we're going to uh, try to achieve during this session is to uh, better understand which patient uh, should have a TAVR versus surgery uh, when they have a bicuspid valve. We're going to learn how to use the Sapien 3 device uh, in an effective fashion when we are dealing with bicuspid valve. And to, under, to better understand what makes Sapien 3 special and bicuspid, bicuspid valve, uh, which uh, some great cases from uh, my colleagues. So with no further ado, I will introduce uh, the, fir the first speaker, uh, Radoslav Parma, a good friend that we had a chance to uh, exchange in multiple in-person meeting before COVID. He's gonna present actually uh, the data, uh, the global data, the current experience with Sapien 3 uh, in bicuspid valve uh, patient. And this topic is pretty um, important and pretty timely actually, Dr. Raj Makar, uh, I believe yesterday, depending on the geography, just present the uh, uh, STS database uh, and the TVT sorry, the registry, and we're going to be able to discuss that in light of your presentation. So, Dr. Parma, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Dear audience, I am Radoslav Parma, interventional cardiologist from Katowice, Poland, and it is my great privilege to share with you the presentation on the current clinical experience using Sapien in bicuspid aortic valve patients. These are my conflicts of interests. And uh, I would like to share with you that starting from the early experience with a Sapien device and with a TAVI maturation, we observed non-optimal outcomes uh, in the beginning of the TAVI era. You can see it on the right that the percentage of paravavial leaks as well as the percentage, the percentage of pacemaker rates were suboptimal and they improved up to 2016. They improved because of the maturation of the TAVI teams and also with the availability of newer generations of the Sapien device from Sapien XT to Sapien 3. What we could also see in the final years was that introduction of a regular CT scanning in all patients recruited for TAVI together with new available devices for TAVI that resulted in good 30-day outcomes of using Sapien 3 in bicuspid aortic valves versus tricuspid aortic valves. Here you can see that uh, we achieved good outcomes uh, in all cause mortality and stroke with uh, increased rates still in pacemaker rates implantations, and but we reduced the percentage of paravavial leaks down to minimal. Such a regular approach to CT sizing and patient recruitment also was shown in a retrospective analysis from the largest TVT registry, which compared in a propensity score matching the bicuspid anatomy in, with tricuspid anatomy in using Sapien 3 devices in these patients. The results were that uh, in these cohorts, the 30-day results and one-year outcomes were favorable for both, uh, for both an anatomical groups of patients with low uh, percentage of mortality and stroke and uh, low percentage of uh, paravavial leaks. Also, the rate of pacemaker implantations were below 10%. Well, from the partner three uh, nested by Caspid registry, together with a continued access protocol, we can also see that such scrutiny results in good outcomes on 30 day uh, observations and also on one year follow up. Here you can see no deaths at 30 days, one death at one year, and only two non disabled strokes at one year. Also, the, the in hospital outcomes were very good in this uh, observation of uh, 71 patients, and there was no need for a second valve and no valve embolization. Other secondary endpoints showed that 30 days and one year follow-up 
was favorable in these patients with the same or lower pacemaker rate uh, than we observed in large uh, scale registries for tricuspid patients and also for bicuspid patients. The paravavular regurgitation of a moderate or, se or severe uh, rate was also minimal uh, in, the, in this very detailed and very uh, strongly defined groups of patients, which also showed that th this regular um, approach to CT uh, size the patients and to use the latest device resulted in good uh, outcomes in these patients. So I would like to also to, to show you the comparison between balloon expandable and self-expandable devices. Here you can see that uh, the bicuspid anatomy differs, and we know it from the uh, Makar's publication, that uh, some bicuspid anatomy is more difficult uh, to treat using TAVI devices and results into worse outcomes. On the left, you can see these outcomes in those difficult bicuspid anatomies treated by the Sapien 3. Although we can see the differences between uh, the easy anatomy without calcification and without uh, lethal calcification or rafe calcification, however, you can see by comparison that the outcomes with the Sapien 3 were better than with the self-expandable devices. And this is especially noticeable for paravavular leaks where using the, the self-expandable device results into uh, a much higher um, probability of paravavular leaks. You can also, uh, we also know that the paravavular leaks, especially in a young population uh, with a bicuspid aortic anatomy, uh, results into an increased probability of mortality after TAVI at one year. So we, what we strive to do is to minimize the rates of paravavular leaks and also minimize the rates of, of pacemakers. And we can, we can see that probably it is the minimal frequency, frequency of additional maneuvers with a Sapien 3 versus with self-expandable devices that may allow us to bring down the rates uh, of both uh, the paravavial and paravavial leaks, pacemaker rates, and also aortic root injury, which we saw in numerous publications presented in the last 10 years. So in summary, I would like to, to notice that we are going to expect an increased rate of bicuspid aortic valve anatomies in the, in the TAVI patients who will be screened in the future. Also that the consistent use of CT may allow us to treat this population effectively and safely, and especially these are the balloon expandable devices uh, of, the new, of the latest generation of Sapien 3 and Sapien 3 Ultra, which may let us minimize the rates of uh, paravavial leaks or pacemaker rates, and also to minimize additional maneuvers, which may benefit these patients in the future. Thank you. Dr. Parma, thank you uh, so much for uh, a great uh, discussion and review of the data currently. So uh, I want to welcome Didier, who just joined us virtually. Um, and we're going to, with no further ado, we're going to jump to a very interesting uh, talk from a surgical perspective. Dr. Kempfer is going to discuss actually which patient should be indicated for uh, heavy and, and with bicuspid. And that after that, we're going to have a lively discussion regarding these two talks. So uh, Dr. Kempfer. All yours. Dear colleagues, it's my privilege to share with you some thoughts on indication for TAVI in bicuspid anatomy. These are my disclosures. So again, I guess it is a known fact that bicuspid, bicuspid aortic valve stenosis is typically a disease seen in the younger patient. It's up to 1% of the worldwide population. And it's quite uh, natural that most of these cases today are treated with surgery. Uh, and subsequently, there's limited experience with TAVI in bicuspid valve anatomy as of today. Now, before we dive into the decision-making for individual patients in bicuspid anatomies, uh, we need to accept a couple of prerequisites. So first of all, we have seen just a minute ago 
that registry results are quite promising for TAVI in bicuspid anatomy, and this is especially true uh, for the usage of balloon expandable devices. On the other hand, we also have to accept that as of today, there is no data from randomized controlled trials for bicuspid low risk patients for the simple fact that bicuspid anatomy was an exclusion criteria in the recent low risk TAVI trials. So this is why guidelines currently still recommend surgical AVR as a gold standard. On the other hand, it is now pretty clear that there is a kind of a subgroup within the bicuspid patient cohort that will present with a so-called unfavorable anatomy, and those patients are at higher risk for significant PVL or even anular rupture, and it's important uh, in the decision-making process to identify those patients. Now, these patients are, are clearly identifiable if you have a look on the kaplan meier curve here. This is the red patient cohort which is going to um, be associated with significant decreased survival. And those patients typically present with significant leaflet calcification and a calcified RAFE and will require modified sizing and implantation techniques, at, at least if a balloon expandable device is used. Now, in addition, it is also uh, um, uh, quite common that bicuspid aortic stenosis patients are going to present with uh, additional dilatation or aneurysm of the ascending aorta. And based on current guidelines recommendation, there is a clear indication for surgical replacement of the ascending if the, di the total diameter exceeds 50 millimeters um, uh, for the ascending. Now, taking all these factors together, um, an expert group uh, uh, consisting of surgeons as well as interventional cardiologists have recently come up with this uh, algorithm. Obviously, this is nothing like a guideline. It's just an expert kind of uh, opinion that should help you in the daily decision-making for bicuspid patients. So I would like to walk you briefly through these um, uh, critical factors here. So first gateway is the presence of a significant aneurysm of the ascending. If this is uh, present, then obviously it's a surgical candidate. If this is uh, not the case, then I would like to draw your attention to the age groups. On the far left, you can see the younger patients, 65 or even less. And in those patients, majority of is going to undergo surgical AVR, eventually even with a mechanical uh, valve. Now on the uh, right side, you can see the old patients, so 80 years and above. And obviously, surgical risk is going to be elevated. So TAVI is going to be a very good option, but only if TAVI is feasible based on the anatomy and if the anatomy is not favorable, then within our team, it needs to be discussed whether or not surgical uh, replacement is an option. Now, the uh, largest, largest patient group is going to be the one in the middle. And this is age uh, wise in between 65 and 80. And here, an uh, absolute important decision making criteria is the anatomy. So, if the anatomy is not favorable for TAVI, then majority of those patients will, um, uh, um, will be surgical candidates. However, if the anatomy is favorable for TAVI, then it is the um, responsibility of the heart team to go through a thorough, thorough assessment based on the typical surgical risk that could be low, intermediate, or high. So for high, TAVI is a very good option. For intermediate risk, again, a potential age uh, cutoff of 75 can be considered. And for the low risk patient, we again need to remind ourselves that we lack the randomized data. So this is why most of these patients will undergo surgery. So to summarize, bicuspid aortic valve stenosis is typically seen in younger patients, and it's often associated with significant aortic aneurysm. We do not have any data from randomized trials for the low-risk bicuspid patients. This is why guidelines still recommend surgery for the majority of patients. However, TAVI may, TAVI may represent an alternative in selected patients, and it's the uh, responsibility of the heart team to select the appropriate patients, and then decision-making should be based on age, calcification patterns, and the surgical risk, and are key factors for best decision making. Thank you for your attention. All right, Dr. Kempford, beautiful presentation. Um, and before we start the, the live discussion, I just want to remember the, uh, remind the uh, audience that please uh, chat, feel free to chat, go on slido.com. Uh, we're going to post one question right now. Uh, which related to, which we're going to kick up the discussion with this, and I'm going to ask uh, maybe our, our, our colleague, Didier, uh, when you face a patient with a bicuspid, 
and we're going to see the, the question very soon uh, appear on the screen. Which criteria or factor would you consider to, 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 to use, or which patient do you do a TAVR or a TAVV on the bicuspid? Um, what about calcium burden on the RAFI? What about the presence of concomitant disease? Uh, Dr. Kempfer talked about the aorta, coronary disease, or others. The cutoff of the age above 70 or below 70. Um, in US, we use 65, but uh, it's, it's, it's not without any uh, um, um, debate. Um, what about the corny eyes? So I want to hear your uh, very practical input about uh, which uh, patient we, you will consider to do a TAVI. Um, and, and we're going to have the result of the poll in maybe one minute. So a very uh, important uh, point that you raised, uh, Philippe, and it's true that uh, we are still in the learning phase. We are still trying to understand uh, who are the suitable candidates for a TAVI uh, with a bicuspid anatomy. As you said, and as uh, Jorg has nicely demonstrated uh, in the previous talk, I think the age of the patient has to play a role and the risk profile, overall risk profile of the patient is really important because if we are facing a young low risk patients, uh, potentially uh, surgery has to be favored because we have to put into perspective the life expectancy of the patient. So I think the age is one of, and the risk profile of the patient is to, has to remain central in the discussion, in the decision making. Uh, then uh, you said 70, I, I, I do believe that uh, according to our local experience here in, in France, 70 years old is, seems reasonable. Uh, below 70, uh, probably surgery should be considered first. Uh, if we move to the uh, associated factors, uh, coronary artery disease, apart from the ascending aorta aneurysm, as Jorg has demonstrated, has to be discussed also, because if you have diffuse coronary artery disease uh, in, a, in a patient that could be at intermediate risk, uh, so a potential surgical candidate, this has to be uh, discussed uh, in a thorough way, and potentially the patient has to be referred uh, to, uh, uh, to surgery. And at last, the calcium uh, burden, uh, the calcium distribution, if we have a very calcified, extremely calcified raffi, extreme calcification at the level of the leaflets, uh, who are, uh, which are going to uh, hamper the overall stent expansion after uh, TAVI, I think this has to be considered and potentially the patient should be discussed once again for surgery. Coronary height, it's true that this has to be also uh, integrated because we have the feeling, even though it's, this is not uh, really, really uh, present uh, uh, within the registry, we have the feeling that there is a high likelihood of coronary obstruction in bicuspid patients. So if we have low coronary, coronary takeoffs, narrow sinuses, something has to be, this has to be discussed and the patient should, within the heart team, potentially be considered for surgery again. So I'm an interventional cardiologist and you see that the first thing I consider for a bicuspid patient is the indication for surgery. And if the patient is not a good surgical candidate, then we may move forward and uh, consider TAVI. We saw sometimes, you know, both are very good for both, the patient are both good for both surgery and TAVI. How do you approach this patient? Because I think sometimes it's obvious, three vessel disease, left main disease, big aorta, that's a no brainer. On the other side, you have the complex TAVI, which has low left main, low coronary. Uh, what about the one that are good for both? We saw sometimes you know, both are very good for both, the patient are both good for both and surgery. So a and typical patient that is 70 years, I assume I it's low it's risk, disease, and the anatomy is favorable for a tower, which means there's no access of a calcification uh, neither under the nor the leaflets, then obviously tower would work. I would expect a very good uh, um, short-term result. But what we also need to kind of uh, uh, keep in mind is that with all these low-risk trials, tower versus surgery, Usually, the picture is that the um, one-year outcome is better for TAVA, at least when it comes to quality of life and this kind of stuff. But then there's also some kind of uh, early hints that the couple of Meyer curves, they tend to cross after uh, two years or beyond. And this is something that I guess is not fully understood yet. And also what we need to remind ourselves is that also the, the uh, incident of relevant leaks, so moderate and above, has come uh, down, uh, luckily, and also the incidence of pacemaker has come down still with surgery, the functional outcome is usually a little bit better. But this obviously comes at a price, and the price is surgery, which is uh, associated with this, uh, elevated risk, especially in the higher risk patient population. So again, coming back to the question, if we have a truly low risk patient, then what I would offer him is a minimally invasive uh, surgical valve 
informing him about the potential option that if this biological valve is going to fail, which is most likely going to happen at 10, 15 years, then there's a beautiful technique called TAVR uh, to replace the biological valve that has been implanted surgically in the first place. Perfect. Uh, so we had some, uh, thank you so much for a great uh, answer. And I think we had some uh, issues, some technical problem. Um, if I can summarize, we, we discussed for the last two minutes, if we had a perfect candidate both for surgery and TAVR, meaning that no dilation on the aorta, no significant coronary disease. Uh, on the other end, bad, uh, no, no adverse uh, feature for TAVR, what will be your, uh, your approach? Um, and, and Didier, maybe you, uh, if you want to summarize, maybe in one minute, uh, because I think you get cut off in your uh, in response. What is your approach at your center when you have a good candidate, 70 years old, um, a good candidate for both, for TAVR or surgery? How do you approach this patient? So uh, to make it uh, short, so I think the, uh, we discussed uh, the patient uh, within the art team. Uh, we uh, also discussed with the patient, depending on the the quality of life that he has, his uh, uh, daily living, what he expects from the future. If the patient is a good candidate for both procedures, I think we, it's uh, worth discussing with him. Uh, if we have, as you nicely uh, summarized, the patient with dilation of the ascending heart above 55, uh, extensive coronary disease with a syntax score more than 32, extensive calcium above of the leaflets uh, and at the level of the raffi, this is a surgical candidate. And for the other ones, we discuss, and uh, if the patient uh, wants TAVI, we may consider that for, for him also. Perfect. And before we go to your case, uh, DDA, I'm gonna put one more uh, controversial comment. It's about the dilation of the aorta. There's some data that suggests that when you uh, remove the, the stenosis, which most of the time give a, a, a eccentric jet that probably is the, on, on, on the, um, the cause of the dilation, you have sometimes stoppage of the progression of dilation uh, or either, either regression of the dilation. Obviously, it's not for all cases. Some have tissue collagen issues, as you well know. Um, so, Dr. Kempford, what is your, uh, your, your thought about having an aorta at 50 and still do TAVR? What, what do you observe? Uh, do you see regression of the aorta? Do you see, how do you factor that in? Because a lot of my surgeons, uh, I refer them for, for, for bicuspid surgery and they don't touch the aorta. Yeah, so actually then it's, uh, honestly, from my point of view, it's pointless to do surgery in the first place. If with a 50 millimeter of, uh, ascending in a low risk patient, this one needs to go. Um, I, I'm fully aware that the, the evidence for that decision making is a little bit sparse, but uh, I guess it's a huge difference whether it's a bicuspid or tricuspid. And a tricuspid, you're uh, most likely right. Once you get rid of the stenosis, there will be most likely no progression. But for the bicuspid, it's less clear. And I personally would uh, replace the ascending in a bicuspid case if the ascending is more than 45, which is also considered within the European guidance. Perfect. All right. So now we're going to move to uh, Didier Cheche, who's going to present uh, uh, a great cases, um, and he's going to share with us uh, his uh, algorithm for sizing. So it's a real pleasure to present the case of bicuspid aortic valve uh, treated with a septic free uh, platform. Here are my uh, disclosures. Uh, so the patient we're going to discuss today is an 83 years lady uh, that uh, was uh, recently symptomatic for a NYHA class 3 diaspnea related to a severe aortic stenosis. As you can see, the main uh, uh, gradient was 52 millimeters of mercury for that lady with an aortic valve area of 0.7 centimeters square. The LVF was mildly depressed, 46 percent, and uh, quite noticeable was a prior history of stroke uh, combined with at baseline on the ECG a right bundle blanch block uh, and a sinus cerebrum. Uh, from a biologist's uh, standpoint, there was nothing noticeable with a, a renal function that was mildly impaired, 45 milli, uh, milliliters per minute for the creatinine clearance. And the uh, coronary angiogram revealed no uh, significant disease. So as we do uh, usually, uh, we uh, went for a heart team assessment and we uh, decided to refer that lady for a TAVI, regardless of the risk scores, uh, given the, the profile of the, the patient. So um, this is probably the most important part of the uh, ass assessment of the, uh, the patient, the MACT. And when we focus on the aortic analyst, the mean area derived diameter was uh, 23.1 millimeter, combined with an LVOT, three millimeters below the analyst measured at 22.5 millimeters. So 
uh, more or less acquired a tubular configuration when we relate, we relate the analyst to the LVOT. So uh, an analyst that was more or less in a gray zone between a 23 and a 26 millimeter device. So this is uh, the uh, city scroll, the city scroll technique. And uh, clearly when you scroll up from the analyst to the sinus of Valsava, you can clearly and immediately identify type one uh, right non bicuspid phenotype with the fusion of the right and the non coronary cusps. And uh, as we do, uh, usually we uh, do the commissure to commissure me measurement four millimeters above the analyst as uh, proposed by the Bavard registry and the measurement was 25.1. So a quite flared configuration when we uh, use the uh, Arctic analyst as the uh, reference. And we also do in our practice, and this is debatable, a, um, a supranular tracing, uh, and it seems to be uh, related to what is what could be the final mean perimeter derived diameter of the analyst uh, of the uh, device post implant. So here the tracing was 20.5. So it's another argument uh, when it comes to uh, the final sizing uh, for the uh, the bioprosthesis. So a type one. Uh, non-right configuration, a flared uh, configuration as compared to the, uh, as related to the Bavard registry and the supranular tracing as at 20.5. Uh, what is quite uh, interesting when we aim at you, uh, utilizing a, a balloon expandable platform is to use that circle method. We placed a virtual 23 millimeter uh, circle within uh, the analyst and the, uh, the sinus of Alsaba. And you can see that the 23 seems to fit both at the level of the analyst and upward without any major interaction, interaction with the, uh, the commissures and the sinus of Alsaba overall. When we do the same uh, exploration, the same analyzing with the a 26, a virtual 26 uh, device, you can see that uh, here the relationship with the, the commissures is more important. Uh, and uh, there is a, a clear risk of sinus sequestration uh, for this uh, patient. So it's this uh, led us uh, to choose a 23 millimeter device combined with the uh, uh, supranular tracing we, that we had that circle uh, method is really important when we aim at using a, a 23 millimeter a, a balloon expandable platform. Uh, so uh, as we do usually, we analyze the overall configuration of the, the, the landing zone, the Arctic route with a sinus of at seven diameter, mean uh, area drive diameter at, at 33.5. And the coronary arteries were high enough, uh, 80 millimeters on the left uh, side and 21 uh, millimeter on the right side. Uh, so uh, we, uh, when we aim at the procedure, we think about the procedure, we have to anticipate what is going to be a proper projection to deploy the device. And here the two cusp view was a RAO 10, code 10 projection as anticipated by the CT scan. And you can see on the right part of the slide that the peripheral vasculature was uh, uh, quite uh, suitable for a transfemoral approach. So if we uh, summarize the sizing for this uh, uh, patient, so we have a type one non-right, uh, uh, non to right uh, a cyrus type uh, biker speed. We have a flare Bavard configuration uh, biker speed and derived from the circle method, uh, we should use a 23 millimeter device. So the strategy for this patient, quite briefly, Sapien 323 with a quite contemporary uh, streamlined optimized approach with conscious sedation, the cerebral protection for this patient, bioradial access, one for the cerebral protection, the other one for the pictet guiding the procedure, ultrasound guiding, uh, right access of the uh, common femoral artery, proglides uh, for its preclosure, direct implantation, and left ventricular wire pacing. And this is our regular strategy for our patients. So a couple of uh, angles of the procedure. So the Kutuka's view, the RAO 10, codal 10 projection, and we can clearly see that we, uh, we have a nice coplanar view uh, uh, with uh, the superimposition of the right and the non-coronary cusp, and that's what we, uh, we aim at. And uh, you can see on the right part of the slide that crossing the valve with the combination of uh, M-plats left one and a slippery wire, a hydrophilic wire like a terimo street, a stiff straight uh, was not a, an issue for that lady. So uh, once we uh, did cross the valve, we had to do a 
a minor adjust, adjustment of the, uh, the uh, projection just to uh, have both in, as uh, Coplana views, uh, the uh, Arctic analysts and uh, the Sapien 3 uh, were getting uh, rid of the uh, parallax that we can see. If you watch the left part of the slide, clearly moving a little bit more colo, we had a better uh, perpendicularity as compared to the, uh, to the Sapien 3. And now, uh, what, what we do usually uh, to position the device is to place the radiolucent line at the analyst, and that's what we obtain. And uh, as you can um, identify, there was a quite major arctic regurgitation, and this was, uh, to our opinion, another argument to move for a direct implantation and to avoid a uh, potentially harmful pre dilatation for this type of patient. Here is the deployment of the, of the device on the rapid pacing, and you can see how accurate is the left ventricular wire, wire, wire pacing. And the final result with a, a device that is sitting very high, as we, uh, we hemmed that, no regurgitation, and that seemed to be uh, quite circular with a nice patency of both the left and the right coronary arteries, but this wasn't a major issue for this patient. So here is the final outcome. So the patient was discharged on day three, uh, one month after the procedure, uh, um, the patient, the lady was in uh, NYHA class 1 diaspnea. She didn't require any pacemaker, uh, despite the fact that uh, she had that baseline, a right bundle branch block. You can see the, the nice hemodynamics of the, the valve with uh, an area of 1.61 centimeters square, a mean gradient below 10 millimeters of mercury, no regurgitation, and a clear improvement in the LVEF. From the CT scan assessment that we've obtained at one month, you can see that the device is really circular uh, from top to bottom in uh, every aspect of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the structure of the Sapien 3, uh, both uh, from the 3D perspective and then when we do the CT scrolls technique, you can see that the diameters remain the same. The implant depth was 1.4, the mean perimeter derived diameter was 20 millimeters, and that once again comes back to that supraannular tracing to uh, that in our experience, uh, provides an anticipation of, of what could be the mean perimeter derived diameter of the, of the device post implant. And this could be another argument when we are in the grazing in selecting the proper uh, valve size. And you can see how circular was the device with an ellipticity index of uh, 0.97. So that was the, uh, the case presentation. And so I'm uh, handing over to you for uh, the discussion now. Thank you very much. All right, Didier, su uh, super uh, cases. Um, as usual, I learned a lot. Uh, before we go to live discussion, I just want to kick in one question that we're going to have on Slido. Uh, and just to recap the, uh, the prior question, funny enough, more than 70% of the, uh, the uh, answering uh, was about the age. People believe that when the age is below, above 70 years old, we should have a TAVR. So the next question will be, which option would you consider as the most efficient to reduce the risk of annular rupture? Either avoid any additional maneuver, especially post dilation or oversizing, undersizing, rigorous and systematic CT scan, refer the patient to surgery in case of severe calcification, or all of the above. So while the audience is um, answering these questions, um, which I believe the answer could be uh, obvious, but um, Didier, uh, there's a lot of question on the chat about pre-dilation. Uh, these valves could be very uh, calcified. Um, Sometimes you have the taper or the flare anatomy. Which patient will you we consider a pre-dilation? And if you pre-dilate, what type of balloon or what size of the balloon you use? Um, so a very, um, so very, very important uh, question, and this is a contemporary concern when we go for uh, TAVI in bicuspid patients. Do we have to predilate, and what are we going to do? I think uh, this relates first to the type of device that we're going to use. If you are considering a self-expanding platform, Definitely, predilatation has to be part of the uh, of the steps of the procedure because we know that the final uh, circularity of the device is not going to be the same as the sapient free. If you aim at using a balloon expandable platform, the sapient free platform, we know. Uh, as for example, as we observed in the Bavard registry, that the circularity at the end is going to be superb. And you've seen that in the, the case that has been presented. So pre-dilatation is not mandatory for the Sapien 3, uh, but it has to be considered in some specific scenarios with extensive calcification, type 2, 
I would say type 2 bicuspid valves should be predilated because we we don't have uh, much uh, knowledge about uh, this phenotype, so I think, I do believe that predilatation should be considered for type 2. And extremely calcified raffae and leaflets, predilatation has to be part. We've seen in that case that the patient experienced uh, aortic regurgitation only with the device across the anatomy. So this is, a, this is going to be a trade-off. We may face uh, some kind of damage of the leaflets and aortic re acute aortic regurgitation, so we have to be prepared. So the device should be prepared if we aim at predilating our bicuspid patient. And uh, quickly, if you, which balloon, how do you size the balloon for predilation? A lot of question in the chat is, uh, so, do you undersize small diameter? What do you use? So it's exactly that. If you aim at predilating, uh, safety has to be first. So we use the minor axis of the analyst at baseline just to predilate, to uh, provide room for the device to uh, cross the anatomy and to be deployed. And if we need to post dilate, it's going to be the same, minor axis of the annulus at baseline. If you need to uh, increase, you use the mean diameter of the annulus at baseline. Perfect. Um, I'm going to go to the result of the poll. It's pretty interesting. 59% of the uh, people believe that rigorous and systemic CT scan uh, is important. Obviously, I think that that's a no-brainer. Um, 24% all of the above. Um, avoid any additional maneuver, especially post dilation, 27%. So I will um, maybe send a question to Dr. Parma. Uh, when I use um, balloon expendable uh, with bicuspid, personally, I never pre dilate, uh, especially, except it's very calcified. I get faced sometimes with a type 2 with massive AI, so that I, I got maybe burned with that. but. When I use self-expendable uh, on the other end, uh, I prefer to post-dilate uh, instead of pre-dilate. What is your thought about that? And after that, we can discuss as a group. Um, mm -hmm. I want to reduce the manipulation uh, for stroke, for risk of rupture. And so I prefer to post-dilate um, um, and maybe run the risk of underexpended valve, which issues. But what is your thought about um, post-dilation only in this bicuspid? So what was uh, beautifully shown uh, by Didier was that uh, our interventions in uh, this younger population should be predictable and we should uh, just pre-plan everything and everything should at least uh, by our program go along with our, with our plan. So it can be actually provisioned by the CT. We prefer to reduce the manipulation as much as possible. Also, we can foresee that the angulation of the aorta or the horizontality of the bicuspid valve may require predilatation or may require a valve which will expand in a horizontal position. We believe that, especially in horizontal anatomies, we can implant uh, the balloon expandable valves without any additional post dilatation. Uh, sometimes the post dilatation is required when we do not want to risk any annular rupture uh, and we decide on the nominal uh, inflation and this is our regular approach. In case we see any, um, any paravavial leaks on the echo and uh, additionally, we see that we are, uh, we, we are low enough uh, to, to decide on the post dilatation, uh, we do it uh, at using additional two to three milliliters uh, in the same delivery system. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. So we have another uh, last question, which will be a nice segue to the, the next talk. How would you address a very large analyst in bicuspid? We talk about more than 800 um, millimeters square. Um, and the, ch the, the choice of uh, response here are a careful CT scan check to look for possible smaller supraannular landing zone, overexpanding the prosthesis, or surgery. And while the audience is answering, I want to uh, congratulate the three of you to be part of this great paper that you just got uh, accepted and published uh, regarding algorithm for bicuspid valve with Sapien 3. And one thing I learned is these three categories of either tubular, either tapered, um, or, um, or flared. And my understanding is most of the sizing uh, for flare and tubular will be annular. Uh, and when you have this uh, tapered, this is where you may change and go superannular, um, which is probably in 15% of the time. Is it, is, is it a right assumption? Is it something that uh, um, I get right? This is a perfect summary. It's exactly that. And it's, uh, it tells us that annular base sizing works 
in the vast majority of the cases, and as you said, in 50% of the cases, in tapered configuration, we may think about maybe not downsizing, but avoiding excessive oversizing uh, for a patient. That's good. And, and, and Dr. Kemper, we're going to see one of your cases, but I was shocked by bicuspid and while people answer about the la, la, large annulus, which is not, is not uh, infrequent with bicuspid, they, they have large annulus. Um, our supraannular sometimes can allow us to use a smaller valve or, or S329 um, and, and have great results despite 800, 850 uh, or 900. What is your experience with that? Now, obviously, uh, uh, you need to have a very good CT scan. And then you need to use these uh, mentioned supraannular sizing concepts. So uh, we as a group has come up with this uh, um, yeah, idea of uh, uh, promoting this circle-based method a little bit more because it's very easy to do. Uh, but obviously there are other options, right? You can even use uh, more sophisticated tools these days that are developing, like simulating the oven plants and stuff like that. But uh, as a general rule, if, you, if the annulus is not small enough to support a regular annular base sizing, then you need to be absolutely sure that there is uh, enough tapering above the annulus that is going to provide a secure anchoring that also is going to seal if you want to uh, use uh, your device. And obviously, most of us will add some additional vol uh, volume into the balloon on top of the super annular uh, sizing strategy in these uh, out of the uh, recommended range a large annulli uh, attempts. Mm -hmm. All right, that's great. So I'm, I'm going to go to the uh, the result of the poll, and then we're going to move on with your uh, wonderful cases, which I think is very uh, provocative and very illustrative of this concept. Um, so 50% uh, of the audience believe that a careful CT obviously is important and to look for possible supraannular lending zone. Uh, and I believe, especially in the taper anatomy, this is something that could be very uh not useful, but I would say mandatory uh, to avoid a catastrophe. Um, Overexpanding the prosthesis in 17%, and um, I'm not sure over ex overexpansion of the prosthesis is, uh, I think is rarely needed in bicuspid, uh, maybe in tubular uh, anatomy, um, but uh, always have to be careful and use the circle, uh, the circle technique, as you mentioned. And 44% believe surgery should be um, should be the, um, the treatment of choice for large annulus. Um, obviously, we can talk later on about uh, re-procedure or the, the, the performance of a second or a third procedure in this patient, which will be important. So with no further ado, we're going to move on to the uh, third case presentation, Dr. Kempford, uh, which is going to present a very uh, a great case, which I believe will be uh, uh, very good for discussion. Dear audience, it is my privilege to share with you our team experience of using TAVI in a patient with a bicuspid aortic valve type 1 and a large aortic annulus. A 76-year-old gentleman was admitted last year to our department with a significant heart failure in the New York uh, classification type 4, and he was diagnosed with severe aortic stenosis. His ejection fraction was reduced to 20%. He had a low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. His history included abdominal aortic aneurysm. He had hydrothorax, which was bilateral and was eight centimeters on both sides. And the patient had undergone previous surgery and chemotherapy for colon cancer. As you can see, uh, he was also chaotic with a BMI of 23 kilometers per square meter. The preprocedural echocardiography showed and confirmed the presence of type 1 by casket aortic valve with a calcified graphy. The maximal gradient was 34. There was a mild aortic regurgitation. The index ABA was 0.6 centimeters square, and the ejection fraction was 20%. The patient had also pulmonary hypertension with an elevated pressure up to 63 millimeters mercury. Here you can see the coronary angiography showing non-significant lesions uh, of the, in the coronary arteries. And also we could see the significant classification of the aortic valve. Because of the mm, mm, patient's condition, uh, the team decided to, to perform aortic valve balloon valvuloplasty using 23 millimeter 
valve balloon. And what we saw was the absence of the waste uh, in this patient. And this uh, uh, procedure was, was considered as a bridge to final destination therapy. After stabilization of this patient, we performed a CT imaging of the, of the patient. And here you could see that the uh, aortic valve area exceeded the, the standards for the largest uh, Sapien 3 uh, 29 millimeter valve. Also, we saw that uh, there was a calcified raphe in this type 1 anatomy. The height of the left main was, uh, was optimal, but there was a significant calcification uh, of the aortic valve complex with a majority of the calcium located in the non-coronary and right coronary uh, sinus. The peripheral access, the femoral access in this patient was optimal. And as we often see that enlarged anatomy of the femoral arteries in bicuspid patients. The bicuspid classification for planning, uh, which was used by our team, was uh, was uh, divided into these three. The most uh, common uh, classifications we use was Severs type 1 with a left and right uh, leaflet fusion. However, we can also use the Bovert uh, registry, which classifies these patients as a tapered or even tubed uh, anatomy. But the Macar and Yoon classification with severe classification of the aortic valve of, of the aortic leaflets and also the classification of the classification of the RAFI points to a high risk of TABI in this uh, specific type of bicuspid anatomy. What we considered between the team while discussing this patient with uh, cardiac surgeons was that it is very frequent that bicuspid anatomy is accompanied by a large uh, aortic valve anatomy. And here you can see the comparison we can be between the tricuspid and bicuspid anatomy of the aortic valve. It is showing that we may expect now in the future that uh, more patients with bicuspid anatomy will appear with large aortic valve complex. What we also know from recent publications is that one-year outcomes with using Sapien 3 devices result in low number of patients with moderate or uh, significant uh, paravavial leaks. We meaning that we may safely use the Sapien 3 devices in patients just as the patient we admitted. We also know from some publications that patients uh, uh, with a with a annual with a bicuspid anatomy and with an annulus exceeding 1,000 millimeters square of the surface area may also be treated uh, with a uh, with a sapien three with a, of the size of 29 millimeters, providing that we scrutinize the CT uh, so that we see that the proper seating may be offered at the inter intercommissional junction. So also what we know is that we may inflate the Sapien 329 with a four or five milliliters of additional contrast solution in order to achieve the greater expansion and proper sealing in the patient we discussed. What we currently use uh, between our teams is the, for strategy planning using CT is the circle method. And we try to match the 29 millimeter Sapien 3 uh, valve uh, to, the, to the CT across the aortic annulus, the coronary sinus, and also to, to analyze the proper seating with this valve at the intercommissional junction uh, height. Uh, here you can see we could expect proper seating in this patient. Also what we discussed is that we may expect a more difficult crossing and for that, we usually use the Amplus, uh, Amplus left one with a five French pigtail with a bent um, with a bent hydrophilic wire. Also, we thought about doing balloon valvioplasty in this patient, but this had already been performed while rescuing this patient. We agreed on using additional two millimeters of contrast and to use a separate annular position while while inflating uh, this valve, 
to achieve the full ceiling in a supra-annular anatomy of the bicuspid valve. And here is uh, the, the presentation of how we performed this procedure. Uh, here you can see the hydrophilic Y crossing, which, was, uh, which took us about 10 minutes to cross uh, using the, the catheters which we, we described, and also the position of the central marker, which is positioned at least one millimeter higher than the expected annulus marked by the pigtail. So what we did was to position the valve uh, a bit high, with a and we started pacing with the, by the Lundquist wire, and we slowly inflated the valve uh, with an increased contrast solution by two milliliters, achieving almost full expansion. And which you can see on the right, the expansion was a bit um, prohibited by the uh, by the resistance from the uh, left-right raphe uh, of this uh, bicuspid complex. The echocardiography on the on the uh, after the implantation on patient discharge was uh, optimal for this patient. We saw no regurgitation, no paravivial leak, and also an optimal gradient of the TAVI. So our takeaway in this patient was that bicuspid and aortic valve anatomy involves large annuli. And we may expect that patients with arch annuli, especially of young age, will appear in the future. Currently, experience with Sapien 3 of 29 means that we may expect low rate or significant paravivial leaks using this balloon expandable device. In order to achieve such optimal outcomes, we need to scrutinize the CT, preferably using the circus method as described, and the high sapin 3 position at the beginning, uh, at, at the end of the inflation, may allow us to reach the small rate of, uh, of pacemaker rates and also to reduce the chance of paravivial leaks. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Parma, um, excellent presentation of an uh, eye implanted 29 valve. Um, now we're going to see another uh, great case. Dr. Kempfer is going to present a, a similar uh, patient, maybe with a different approach, maybe a, a little bit sicker from an anatomy point of view. So Dr. Kempfer, why don't you uh, move forward with your case, and then we're going to have a live discussion about these challenging cases. Hello, my name is Axel Unmahon, and it's my privilege to introduce our case to you. It's a TAVI procedure in a bicuspid scenario, and the case will be done by your Kempford and Christoph Klein. It's a 76-year-old male patient who had been admitted with severe and symptomatic aortic valve stenosis. The main uh, comorbidity of the patient is a uh, malignancy of the jawbone. Uh, regardless of the arithmetic risk profile, we consider this patient as a risk patient based on his comorbidity. Looking on the coronaries, there's no stenosis. Looking on the echo, it confirms a critical aortic valve stenosis. Mean transvalvular pressure gradient exceeds 60 millimeters of mercury. This is the CT strategy planning based on the three mangio tool. What we see here is a highly calcified valve uh, with a calcium volume above 3,500 cubic millimeters. It's a bicuspid type 1 aortic valve with excessive leaflet calcification and with calcified raffia. Yeah. So now we are going to continue with this discussion of the case strategy in detail. Therefore, I would like to hand over to Jörg and Christoph. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Axel. So, Christoph, I guess we need to uh, discuss a little bit the strategy of this uh, case, which actually is a little bit challenging. So, before we do that, I think it is important to point out that uh, each and every bicuspid anatomy is different, and as has been shown nicely by you and colleagues, that actually the uh, underlying anatomy is linked to uh, the outcome and the mortality. So it's absolutely critical to pick up those cases that have a challenging or even hostile landing zone, which is uh, in case of a calcified rafa and or excess of lethal calcification. Next. So let's have a look on the configuration in this particular case. So based on the Sivas calcification, we have a type one with a rafa in between the left and the right. This is the usual configuration. If we have a look on the Bavard uh, classification, which is more uh, the diameter compared at the annular level to the supraannular level, you can see that's a tube con configuration. 
And then again, based on the Yoon classification, I guess that we don't have a hostile here, but definitely we have a challenging landing zone as we have excess of lethal calcification as well as a calcified raffle. So the supra analyzing concept uh, is uh, absolutely uh, important in these calcified bicuspid cases. And uh, recently, the so-called circle method has been suggested. So what it does actually, it will give you a circle with either a 26 or in this case a 29 uh, millimeter represent uh, uh, valve and then you scroll through the different planes and have a look about the ceiling and also the potential risk for rupture. So again if we re uh, uh, remember that based on the annular area clearly this would be in the range of a 29 but if we now have a look on the circle method above the annulus you can see that especially at the level of three millimeter we get the uh, idea that the 29 so the blue circle is uh, really going to push the calcium and it needs to go somewhere. So this is e either going to lead to a, a, a deformed stent, so under expansion, or worst case scenario, even to a rupture. And if you then have a look at the red circle at the three millimeter level, uh, there's so much calcification that basically we think at this level it should seal. And this is why we are kind of in between the two sizes, but I guess we are going to go with the small level of the so-called true sizing concept. Important in every uh, TAVI procedure is um, is the coplanar view that we have, and um, in type one bicuspid anatomy, it's not as crucial um, compared to the type zero, where it can come become quite um, uh, difficult. There's always the double pigtail strategy um, that you can use if you are unsure doing fluoroscopy. Um, <clears throat> now. I think um, in this case, um, with the high calcium load, I think we definitely should do a pre-dilatation um, uh, um, with a balloon. And at the same time, we can use that procedure to kind of verify the, um, the size of the valve that we um, want to use. Okay, so we have all our stuff in place. So let me briefly walk you through our uh, setup, the usual thing, uh, sedated patient, and we have a six French picton on the left an ipsilateral safety wire that is protected by a four French dilator. This is your standard setup. Then pre-closed with two proglide are the access for the valve. Because we do expect heavily calcification here, we've decided to use a claret system, which is uh, in uh, the radial. We've just done the angiography in the arch to position the claret. It's a lot of calcification. Yeah, as expected. I mean, this is what we discussed. This is why we most likely will uh, true size the valve to the supra annular circle based uh, method diameter. Uh, but before we can do so, we need to cross, which also is going to be lots of fun. Oh, okay, so we exchange to the uh, dedicated Tavi wire, which is going to be in Novi today. So it's important that you don't entangle the wire in the trabecula. Besser. Und Schuss. Okay, und up. Okay, so let's assess our balloon sizing. So the balloon is open, it's a 25. It still has a waist, which is again reassuring that the 26 is uh, not oversized. Uh, and also what we obviously see, that's 100% ceiling. And also what I did, a uh, little bit of kind of a pull-push test. And also we had an idea that it's rock stable. So I guess this is uh, the most crucial decision making in this whole procedure, whether, to now, whether or not to go for 29 or 26. And we think that this is one of these typical cases where the landing zone is not necessarily hostile, but at least it is dangerous or challenging. And if we would go with the annular base 29, then there's a high chance that we are going to induce a VSD here. Especially as you can see that the calcium um um, load on the left coronary sinus. Now you see it's already it's pushed to the side, and it's already at the edge of the of, of yes. the sinus. So if you take a larger valve, you might stretch it more into the sinus wall, and and, right. and that's dangerous. So if you can seal it with a 26, yes. I think it's a more a safer procedure. Okay, so this is now the 26 Ultra. We will do the usual thing, we will load before crossing. So we have pre-ballooned, so hopefully we will not have uh, difficulties in uh, crossing, especially in bicuspids or in heavy calcified uh, landing zones. If you do not do pre-dilatation, expect some difficulties for crossing, and this also might dislodge the uh, valve slightly from the balloon. 
in the bicuspid anatomy and especially in the calcified one, you want to aim low, higher than in a tricuspid. So the aim here is to get as high as possible for final deployment height of, let's say, 90-10. So if you're in doubt about the marker, you can also use the uh, radio lucent line. Um, definitely not lower than that. Definitely not. Maybe even slightly higher because we do expect early anchoring, which is going to give you or lead you to a higher implant. Now there's still a lot of motion. I think yes. we're going to see it better when we are on yeah. the rapid pacing. Angio und Schuss. Is good? Yeah. So? Yeah, so it's good. Yeah. 22, 23, and up. Okay, so we stop the pacing. So pressure is recovering, uh, this is good. So let's get rid of the delivery and have a look on the positioning and the PVL situation. Yeah, we aimed definitely higher than we would have done in a tricuspid case. And so officially the recommendation is try to get at a 90-10. But honestly, even in very hard calcified cases, if you end up 100% or let's say 95-5, even this is good because uh, based on the circle method, remember that we have uh, sized here, uh, having in mind a supra annular ceiling concept. And definitely this valve is not going to go anywhere, given the amount of calcification. First of all, we had coplanar view. Then uh, I think we ended up 95.5 or 98.2, something like that, but definitely high. And I think this is one of these take home messages aim higher in these nasty uh, bicuspid landing zones than you would do in a tricuspid. Then obviously the true sizing concept based on the uh, supra annular circle method uh, worked very well here. We have definitely kind of used one size smaller than we actually would have done based on an annular sizing strategy. But still you can see that you have a waste, at least on the non-coronary cusp, which is indicating that a larger valve would not have helped at all. And also in the regard to the ceiling, I think it's quite good. It's a tiny puff. It's, it's not uh, any residual leak that is of relevance, but maybe we'll do another injection once the pigtail is out. And in an RAO orientation. In the RNO orientation, yes. But f before we do so, let's uh, measure the gradient, pressure tracings, also have a look on the LVEDP. But when you, when you look at this image, what you also can kind of anticipate is a larger valve could have kind of gone very much to the edge of the of the non-coronary cusp. Yes. Um, and with the risk of perforation because the calcium load like here is more on the left than on the non-coronary. Yeah. So um, I'm actually quite happy. I mean, it's, yeah. a, na it's a nasty landing zone. So uh, if you can get away with a mild PVL, uh, that is uh, to be accepted, definitely. Do not do any uh, post-ballooning. This was the idea of not stretching the landing zone too much. And definitely there's no increase in the LVEDP. It is not to be expected. Um, so I guess that um, we might do now, we might retrieve the picture from the ventricle and then um, we might uh, do a final angio in ARIO to assess the uh, uh, tiny PVL there. A good result, I think. There is a trace um, regurgitation jet. Also here, you see there is this kind of a little bit waste of the of the valve. So a bigger valve wouldn't have helped At all. a lot more. And uh, calculation of the pressure, uh, pressure gradients and effective orifice area showed us uh, maximal pressure of 15, mean pressure 7, and effective orifice area 2.5, so very nice result. So I think in the, uh, the result is quite good. It's only a kind of a mild PVL, which is absolutely okay in this anatomy. Again, I think we aimed very high, ended up 95.5, so to say. So a clinical kind of um, standard of care. In our center has become to do a post-implant 4D scan for the bicuspid uh, anatomies, or at least those that are super calcified. And as you can see here, see circular stand expansion, freely moving uh, leaflets, or so no early sign of valve thrombosis, and obviously uh, good access to the coronaries. And with that, thank you, and bye-bye. Thank you for watching, yeah, bye-bye.
All right, wow. Um, Dr. Parma, Dr. Kempert, um, I can be speechless because these cases uh, were very, very challenging. Um, there's a lot of reaction from the audience. I want to give some uh, attention to that. Um, before, before we go into the live discussion and address some comment of the audience, I want to congratulate both of you. They were very challenging cases, and I'm glad to see a surgeon did probably the most complex bicuspid I ever saw, uh, but that's, that's very well uh, managed Endel. The first question will, will come on the chat would be, what will you do in case of borderline sizing between two THV with a sapient three in presence of a bicuspid? Will you have a tendency to A, undersize, choose, choose a smaller valve like we just uh, saw with Dr. Kemper, or a B, choose the larger THV size as possible. And C, use a balloon sizing to confirm the THV size. Um, I think these two cases were very, very good because the one, both of them were large analysts. Uh, one case was extremely calcified when we did the smaller valve. The other case was Calcify, I will not say extremely calcified, but significantly calcified. And we, you, you went with a appropriately typical annular sizing. Um, I just want to give a, the chance maybe to, um, to uh, Didier, maybe to comment on, on your thought uh, about these two cases, and then we can engage uh, because I think these two cases were very rich in, 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 in uh, point for discussion. Yeah, exactly. And these were uh, two superb cases, uh, which perfectly illustrates the, uh, uh, the challenges of bicuspid aortic valves when it comes to TAVI. What we've seen from the Bavard registry with this uh, systematic post-procedural post, uh, CT scan assessment was a constant un under-expansion of the stand frame, about 10 to 15 percent. It tells us that uh, oversizing aggressively in, bi in bicuspid doesn't make sense as Jorg and his team has perfectly demonstrated, because even uh, when we, you choose the, the smaller valve size, you have a nice, a nice expansion, nice circularity, and no regurgitation. And that uh, constant under expansion needs to be integrated in the sizing algorithm. Being too aggressive in bicuspid aortic valves is risky, is, it can be harmful for the patient, and this is one of the major learning that I, I get from these two superb cases. Avoid excessive oversizing. This is really crucial for the patient. I, I want to ask um, uh, Org about this case because you're a surgeon and you see these, these valves uh, live, you know, um, and all my surgeon, every time we do TAVR, and, and when they do surgery on bicuspid, that's why I send them sometime, they say, that was the right decision. These valves are so calcified, there is no way we will be able to expand them. And they always shock that, that we succeed. Uh, what is your word of wisdom when you operate on these valves and, and you did a very, very, very calcified case with eye implant, smaller valve, and very circular valve at the end, which is very uh, important, as Didi pointed out. What is your word of wisdom uh, acknowledging that it's possible to do uh, TAVR uh, in, um, in bicuspid, but, but we need to be careful? Mm. What is your take on message? Yeah, so first of all, uh, I think most surgeons should invite their interventional cardiology partners to have a look and actually we even touch a bicuspid calcified valve in the OR uh, because this is amazing how, uh, how restrictive this anatomy actually is. But on the other hand, it also tells you how much force this balloons Possess, and this is why it's a it's a very it's a great tool on one side, but on the other hand, it can turn into a very very dangerous weapon. And this is what Didier was pain, pointing to. In these anatomies, uh, the force that is required to uh, implant these valves is really high, and the calcium needs to go somewhere. And this is why it's so important to uh, adapt the sizing to the supraanular complex in this specific anatomy. Don't get the message wrong. So it's not nothing to be concerned with in a standard tricuspid case. They would go with your annular sizing and are absolutely fine. But in the bicuspid, heavily calcified valves that have a, um, also a kind of a tapered configuration, it's absolutely crucial to go with these um, uh, supraannular sizing concept, be it the circle method or, or any uh, other technique. Great. Dr. Parma, um one of the uh, comments uh, from the audience was the concern of uh, PVL, valve embolization, with supraannular um, implantation, um, especially when we undersize. <clears throat> what, are you, what, what, what will you answer um, the audience, um, especially if you, you, you talk about a taper anatomy, but uh, what, what is your word of wisdom in terms of um, undersizing, I am planned in terms of PVL and, and, and risk of a catastrophe. 
uh, it was my the benefit also for me to have discussed this uh, this matter for the past six months, and we uh, we put out uh, all the hints in the consensus, which is going to be published uh, in in the days to come. Uh, our uh, our thought is that whenever we have any doubts whether a large valve or a smaller one would fit, just as Mike Didier said, we usually decide on downsizing. Why? Because it is usually that the, these valves have a RAFI and that they are a bit calcified so that we prevent full expansion or to the, uh, of the valve to reaching the nominal size. So we, we can expect that the anatomy of the bicuspid valve does not allow full expansion to the maximum um, diameter available. So whenever we have any doubts in anatomy without calcium, uh, then we may uh, decide on a larger valve because we, we may fear that uh, the valve may dislocate. It has never happened uh, in our series. And uh, although we have a, a much higher percentage, up to 20% of bicuspidity in our cohort. So I wouldn't be afraid of the valve dislocation. We usually position the valve at least one marker height above the annular level uh, with the reference of the pigtail. Perfect. Uh, before we go to the uh, next question, I just want to summarize the chat. Actually, 57% uh, of the audience will choose a balloon sizing strategy in case of borderline sizing. Uh, that's, that's very interesting. Um, and 35% will choose the smallest THV, 10% uh, the, um, um, the larger THV. Um, I want to ask uh, Didier, how may, uh, what is your, uh, how often do you, are you using balloon sizing, um, not predilation, but balloon sizing in your bicuspid valve? So um, it depends. Um, I'm not using balloon uh, and geography for sizing. I have to be honest with you because we are all sharing experience. So let's discuss uh, quite freely about that. I use it for first assessing the movement of the calcium. Where is the calcium going to, uh, to, to go to? As Jorg has mentioned, the calcium has to, has to go somewhere. So I, I, want, I like to see the movement of the calcium. If it's going towards the ostium of the coronary arteries with a higher risk of obstruction, I'm going to integrate that into the procedural steps and the procedural refinements that are going to occur for these particular patients. Uh, for sizing in borderline cases, we, uh, we have seen through all these superb cases the value of CT scan assessment. And the philosophy, as you mentioned, uh, Philippe, Radek, Jorg, is when you are in a gray zone, in bicuspid anatomies, there's no need to oversize, to upsize. Use the smaller valve size, it's going to fit. Why? Because the valve, the valve is not going to reach its maximal diameter. It's a bicuspid anatomy. It's going to be under-expanded. So there is no rationale for uh, using the, the larger valve size in borderline gray zones. So the balloon sizing is not really for sizing. It's more to appreciate the movement of the calcium, to my experience. Because if when I am in a gray zone, I'm going to 100% select the smaller valve size because I know that it's going to fit, particularly with the sapient free platform and achieve circularity and sealing. That's great, uh, great tip. So I I'm going to follow up with another question before we go with the audience comment, which I think was very interesting, is the other poll question, what will be your sizing approach in bicuspid using Sapien 3? And that, I think that will be more like a post-test question because uh, obviously we discussed that at large. Are you going to go for annular sizing, uh, same as tricuspid, or are you going to go intercommissural or supraannular, especially uh, if you have a taper configuration? I think we discussed that um, a lot. Uh, one, audience, one member of the uh, audience uh, asked a great question, um, and I'm going to send this question first to Dr. Kempford, who probably has the best uh, understanding of anatomy. Is there a uh, calcification of the raphe in certain position that worry you the most in bicuspid? For example, the fusion between the right and the non coronary cusp. If this, this raphe is severely calcified and bulky, are you more afraid of VSD or catastrophe? Uh, or, or doesn't really matter? You're going to adjust your technique of a tavern implantation in, in accordance? Or is there a type of calcification or valve that really worry you the most um, when you do uh, tavern? Yeah, so uh, obviously the more calcification, uh, the more worries, so to say, but uh, it also depends on the location. So a uh, raphe usually is linked to the leaflets only. 
So it's something that you could think of that it's going to uh, uh, it's going to uh, impose an, uh, a kind of a barrier once you implant a valve, and this is why the smaller valve always is going to uh, be anchored. But it is not something that you have to be afraid of. What is really nasty is if this calcified rafe gets some uh, connection to the LVOT calcification. Those cases that we like to call lazy leaflets is something that when you see a calcification at the annular level, which is in the middle of the annulus and doesn't seem to have any kind of uh, connection to the surrounding tissue, then usually this is a rafe that is linked to uh, LVOT calcification. In those cases, I would really think twice whether or not we want to go for double procedure because those are the, those that have the highest risk of annular rupture. So whenever the leaflet calcification is in one continu continuation to the LVOT calcification, this is really nasty and should be avoided. That's great. Uh, Dr. Parma, anything you're afraid in the bicuspid other than the bicuspid itself? <laughs> uh, actually, with a, with a strong team, uh, and including, uh, of course, cardiac surgeons, interventional cardiologists, also echocardiographers. Uh, I think we should not worry because we will select the right treatment to our patients. We are worried about young patients, how to select them. Uh, and I think it, uh, that uh, previous CT scan is also important because if we see no progression uh, of the aortic dilatation, which has to be also included into our decision making, uh, then we may decide uh, even better on whether to operate on this patient and exclude this aortic uh, aneurysm or not, or should we offer TAVI. Uh, I think that uh, even with the LVOT calcification, just as Jörg uh, beautifully said, uh, we, this, is, this may be still an argument for a smaller valves, because what we usually do is to downsize the valve, and we do not try to overstretch it, uh, because we don't want to uh, risk any annular rupture, and also we don't, don't want to risk a pacemaker implantation. So we try to downsize in order to reduce the risk. And the beauty of the balloon expandable system is that we may actually predict from the CT uh, the, the result we are going to expect, uh, uh, including the, uh, the final uh, the shape of the valve, and also that we do not uh, overstretch, but still have the circular shape of the procedures. That's great. All right, so I want to share the result of the poll with you in the audience. So I, I'm, I'm glad to announce that 97% of uh, the people believe that we're going to do a supranular sizing or ICD sizing, especially in taper configuration. Um, so so that, that that's great. I want to share one last question, and then we can discuss. Um, so. We discussed about that a little bit, but which is the final implant position you will target in bicuspid when using Sapien 3 Ultra? Same as for tricuspid, 80, 20, or 90, 10. Slightly higher if annulus leaflet are highly calcified. Higher than tricuspid, up to 100 and zero in case of taper configuration and undersizing of the valve. So I'm gonna let the audience uh, answer. Um, I wanna share one observation from all your great cases is, uh, the age demography of these patients were eight, more than 80 years old in one case, 76 years old, and 76 years old. Um, obviously, they're still TAVR candidate. They're, they're almost like intermediate risk or high risk. Um, actually, they were all high risk, 20% EF and bicuspid, uh, by B, uh, balloon valvoplasty salvage. Um, so I think for, from my point, it seemed mm -hmm. that um, these bicuspid, maybe they came too late. Uh, it seemed that bicuspid usually come earlier, but we still see these 80 years old coming with bicuspid. What is your your thought process about seeing bicuspid at 80 years old? Is it because there's too uh, type of demography? Uh, is it because they wait too long? These gradient most of the time were like the highest gradient we ever saw, peak gradient, mean gradient of like 80. So I uh, would we'll ask Didier first. Yeah. Um, what is your, your your feeling about the demography? Do you, did did you, we did you get it wrong at the beginning for and then we realized that life is different? So I think it's uh, this is a, a superb question and uh, I think you have a, a, a nice thoughts about that, Philippe. And to my opinion, we uh, operate too late on these patients. Potentially, uh, there is a role for better exploration of uh, aortic stenosis in, in general. And in these patients that could have been asymptomatic if it was two, three, five years before uh, the actual 
uh, event, it would have been uh, potentially easier to treat these patients with uh, uh, even better uh, uh, procedural and clinical outcomes. So. Uh, the uh, diagnosis of uh, aortic stenosis has to, uh, to improve, uh, combining uh, stress echo, exercise testing, uh, CMR, strain uh, uh, assessment uh, on echo. Everything has to be combined, and you know that through the, the trial that you're running, Philippe. This is crucial. I think this is the next step. We are treating 80 years old, 90 years old patients, but potentially we should move to younger patients because we know that even in this riskier population, we have exceptional clinical and procedural outcomes. So this should be translated into younger patients, potentially less symptomatic. So I do agree with you. We pro probably come a little bit late for this patient. So we all need to move as uh, a, a, the community uh, to move forward towards better and earlier assessment and diagnosis of these patients. I do agree with you. And Dr. Kempfer, you see this patient, and I'm, obviously I'm a little biased because we're running the early TAVR trial um, in, in which uh, targets severe asymptomatic patient. But like you said, Didier, this population are still a, a older population. They're TAVR candidate. And there's a very nice trial that was um, published in New England with surgery, obviously with very severe Peak velocity more than 5.5. Five. No treadmill was done. They were deemed to be asymptomatic, but no stress. And 65 years old was a mean age. And there, there were a mortality benefit of uh, surgical AVR, mainly done with mechanical valve. So um, when you operate on a bicuspid patient, do you see anything different in the LV? Do you, sing, do you see that the LV is thicker? Do you see that they have more AFib? Because Raj Makar data that he just published, uh, presented yesterday or to, to, today, depending on the, the time of the day at, <laughs> in Paris. But 20% um, of the P people still have AFib, and, and they are all in class three or four. What is your feeling? Do you think we'll operate on them too late, or we send them too late? Yeah, it's hard to tell. I don't know any specific data, but it seems that there are two types of uh, bicuspid patients. I get the impression just from operating on them every day, you, you have two types of anatomy. There are those that almost look like a tricuspid, but they have more kind of a fusion. It looks like a fusion of usually the left and the right. And those have the usual prognosis. They come, come also relatively late. It's also the, those patients that we mostly do tower on, right? So these typical 80-year-old that, yes, they have some calcification. It looks bicuspid on uh, CT, but sometimes, honestly, you are not even sure whether or not it's a tricuspid or if it's a bicuspid with a tiny rafe. And then are those... The other kind of group of patients are those that tend to come very early and they have a real chunk of calcification, one continuity from the usual left to the right. And those are those patients that seem to have a different disease. And I fully agree, those seem to have more rapid uh, advancement of their diseases. And so it's very easy to, to catch them uh, late in disease process. So it seems to be that there are two types of anatomies that I have not seen described yet. There's, a lot of work to do, but now we have cardiologists on board, and usually they advance the research <laughs> compared to if surgeons do it alone. All right, so um, that, that's a very good answer, and I will say that one of the, the, the discomfort that came from the community, and sometimes the surgeon is, obviously there's bicuspid, like you said, in bicuspid. Um, there's bicuspid type 1, the typical one with circular and no adverse feature. To be quite honest, this is, this is similar to tricuspid, and you can do whatever you want depending on the same risk factor, anatomy, feature, TAVR versus SAVR. But what makes people very uncomfortable is the typical type 0, type 2, even the sometimes unicuspid VAT that we see, and these misbehave uh, during balloon babloplasty, for example. They're totally different animal. But you're right, and, and this is where we need uh, CT scan, uh, you know, measurement and planning because these patients are totally different animal. Um, so I want to share with you the, um, the result of the positioning of the Sapien 3. So 56% um, will, will position the valve as 100 zero um, in case of taper configuration or undersizing, which is great. 44% um, will uh, position the valve slightly higher um, if the leaflet are calcified. And 12% uh, will uh, do the same as tricuspid, uh, the tricuspid value, 80, 20, or 90, 10. Uh, I think we have like three minutes left, and I want to ask one question uh, in terms of lifetime management of this patient. And uh, we talk about 70 and 80 years old patient. Um, let's talk about 50 and 60 years old patient, or se let's say 65 or ALT 70. Um, 
these patients most likely will need a second intervention. Um, and what, what for you, and uh, maybe 30 seconds each of you, what will be the most important thing on CT scan to plan the secondary intervention? And what will be the no-go? And what will be permissive for TAVR in terms of putting a second TAVR or maybe a third TAVR or doing a surgery first and then the valve and valve later or maybe TAVR, surgery, TAVR? So just maybe 45 seconds each and then we're going to conclude about re-intervention. I need to go first. Yeah, I go first. So uh, obviously, don't forget about surgery. Minimally invasive access is also still there. So also surgery is uh, evolving. There's also a nice Edwards uh, surgical valve, the uh, Inspirus, that uh, is made to host the tower procedure down the road. So this is obviously a good uh, solution. But irrespectively, whether or not to go for a first round surgery or interventional uh, approach, just think of coronary access for the valve and valve in the future. And this is why you should stay in the first round below the coronaries, uh, coronaries with any device. So if I may go a second, I would say yeah. that for me, the diameter of the device we're going to use plays a role. If yes. I'm going to put a very small uh, uh, sapient free or any other platforms, I would consider surgery because uh, potentially if we aim at uh, performing a second uh, transcaptor procedure, this could be an issue in terms of hemodynamics for the patient. So I think this has to be considered. If I have a large anatomy, I, I may go for a, a large sapient free without any doubt. Dr. Parma? I second the previous ones, but also will add uh, the heavy calcification of the valve and uh, also conduction disturbances uh, just to avoid any pacemaker implantation in a young patient. Uh, so I'm not mm, all the time worried about the coronary access because usually the aortic route in bicuspid aortic patients is wide. So with a low prosthesis, we, we can guarantee the access in the future. All right. So I, I want to thank everyone for this uh, fantastic uh, webinar. I learned a lot in preparation of this. I want to thank also Edward Life Science for supporting this. And I will congratulate uh, three of you to uh, have written such an important algorithm how to treat these bicuspid valve with Sapien 3. Um, I will take 20 seconds to summarize saying that bicuspid will be even more frequent in the future, both in old people and in young patients. We still have a lot to learn, but today uh, we realize that it's possible to do TAVR in the uh, appropriate patient with the appropriate technique. CT scan is the key uh, in, in planning this procedure. Um, I learned actually that for specific anatomy, maybe in 20% of the time, especially tapered anatomy with supracalcified raphe, supraannular and undersizing might be the best option. And I will say, I will finish by saying that the hard team approach had never been that important, especially in low risk with bicuspid and with a, a to uh, a cardiologist with the surgeon around a CT scan, I think we want to reach a good consensus and improve patient outcome. So I want to finish there and thanks again, Edward Life Science, for sponsoring this and thanks to uh, uh, three of you for um, doing such a fantastic job. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys.